Hi everyone, thank you so much for being here. I just first want to say thank you to Khaki Lab for, uh, for inviting me to share some of my new work with you. And uh, thanks especially to Farooq, to Diksha, to Rohan, and everyone that's been working behind the scenes to put this together. And also a quick shout out to two old friends that I'm so delighted to see here today. Uh, Sucharita and Pooja, thank you so much for being here. Um, okay, so um, I'll just begin. My presentation, as Rohan already said, today draws on my new book, uh, which is titled Bombay Hustle. And I'm going to start uh, sharing my screen now so that we can launch into this. Okay, so um, in Bombay Hustle, I present a history of the material practices that helped consolidate Bombay's stocky film industry in the 1930s. I narrate a history of Bombay cinema as a history of production, specifically looking at a formative period in the life of Bombay cinema, which is the transition from the silent era to the talky era in the 1930s. I show how cinema during this very turbulent time in the life of India entered into every area of urban life. And my argument is that the screen, right, the final image that you see in a movie theater is only one small part of a very dense ecology of things and people that are constantly mutually shaping and constituting cinema, that thing that we call cinema. A lot of my inspiration for writing this book and for focusing not so much on films, but on the practices of, of film production, of filmmaking, and a great interest in the labor that goes into, into various aspects of film production, draw on my own uh, work experience uh, from 2004 to 2007, when I was working full-time in Bombay's film and television industries. Okay, that's just a, a, a fun photograph that I found after a long time when in 2005 when I was working as an assistant director. Now during this time, I freelanced from job to job. I moved from one apartment to another, always struggling to keep up with the rent increases. As you're familiar with, that's, that's the Bombay life. Now often when I would return home, say late at night in an auto rickshaw, a street corner like this, a wash in this yellow tungsten light would suddenly feel like a film set, like a movie set. And often when I would be driving along, say Marine Drive or waiting at Churchgate Station for the Borivili fast train, I would find myself humming songs like Rim Jim Gire Savan or Bhavara Man, where memories of cinema started to articulate my subconscious emotions. Even before I knew I was feeling something, a film song would just, would just arrive in my head to help me understand what I was feeling. And in moments like these, cinema and the city started to merge into one. So thinking with lived experiences like this, both my own experience of working in Bombay and the experiences of hundreds of historical protagonists whom I have met in the archive, um, and these images are to illustrate some of the archival um, characters, protagonists, many of them now friends, notionally for me, that have helped me think about Bombay cinema as a cine ecology, where bodies, technologies, and environments collectively shape the production of cinematic meaning. The meanings of films and the meaning of cinema as culture are not confined to the screen or to a studio. Cinema exceeds the content on the film screen and includes a variety of very embodied cultural techniques that take place long before the film image even reaches the theater. So what I argue in my book is that the work of ideating, of acting, writing, dancing, stitching, lighting, or even simply waiting on the sets in preparation for the next shot should be considered very integral to the history of cinema. How did people choose and develop stories for India's early films? Who funded these movies? Who were the people who decided to join this experimental 
new art form, which is also a very risky business? How did the cityscape and the climate of Bombay impact the movies of the time? And what can these histories tell us about contemporary cinema in Bombay? So without answers to some of these questions, we might never truly understand the significance of the parallel historical journey of Bombay city and Bombay cinema in the 20th century. Now, one of the early key moments in my research was when I set out to look for the premises of a very iconic uh, old but now forgotten talkie studio called Bombay Talkies, which was set up in Malad. Now, Bombay Talkies was established in 1934, and this is actually what the ruins of it still look like today. And I was very excited to see on Rohan Shukumar's Instagram page some photographs he's taken just perhaps two weeks ago, which kind of reassures me that something of the studio is, is still present in, in this form. Now, when I was looking for Bombay Talkies um, way back, I think in perhaps 2010, uh, all I had was a Google map address. I'd gone on Google Maps, I typed in Bombay Talkies, I got some very intricate directions. So I went, I, I hired an auto rickshaw and I told the auto driver, we're going to this place. And we just couldn't locate the studio. And we kept going round and round in circles. It's only when I was on the phone with a friend and I said, we, we can't find Bombay Talkies, we, I'm heading back. The auto driver turned back and he said, so you want to go to Bombay Talkies? Pehle kyun nahi bataya? And he basically said that we are already at Bombay Talkies, right? So there was no studio building or any big gate to a studio that was available. Their entire lot has now become a series of metal workshops and a garbage dump. But people who live and work in that area call that entire block Bombay Talkies. So Bombay Talkies is not for these people any more limited to one building, right? Or a set of studios, but it's the entire neighborhood is called Bombay Talkies. And in that instant, I realized that there are many ways in which the past of cinema continues to linger in the current contemporary city. You just need a slightly different angle of view to see how the past continues into the present. And here, I just wanna show you an image of um, a film called Jeevan Naya from 1936, 37 are uh, produced by Bombay Talkies, which is shot in the front lawns of Bombay Talkies studio. And here you see a building which used to be the Bombay Talkies office building. And you will recognize that this is the same structure that currently exists in a, in a very different form today. But uh, it's very startling to be able to see some semblance of this transition from an old photograph into a, a, a living concrete building. So in today's talk, I want to discuss three very specific ways in which the advantages and the peculiarities of Bombay City made an impact on the early film topics and subjects, as well as filmmaking practices of what we now call Bombay cinema. The talk is divided into three sections on three themes, basically relating to Bombay's cotton, its mills and its mill workers, and the experience of the monsoon in Bombay. So in 1932, a very cheaply printed Hindi weekly film magazine called Cinema Sansar, which translates as Cinema World, started circulating in Bombay. It regularly published weekly rates for American cotton futures alongside film advertisements and news. And you can see here uh, written in Hindi, America Cotton Futures with the prices of the week. Now this very casual juxtaposition of the world of cotton futures on one hand and cinema on the other hand, invited me to think a bit deeper about what were the actual, were there any actual more direct connections between cotton trading and early cinema? Now both cinema and cotton were pivotal to the emergence of Bombay as South Asia's foremost industrial metropolis. The first cotton mills were built in the city in the 1850s and cotton rapidly became India's most important industry 
controlled in large part, and this is very important, a lot of the cotton mills were actually controlled by indigenous capital, which is a very rare thing uh, in this moment of late colonialism. And the cotton industry propelled Bombay's business and labor concerns to the national stage. And this is when conversation about Bombay started to become nationally significant. Now, cinema entered the scene at the very end of the 19th century uh, in the 1890s, but cinema also played a very major role in consolidating and confirming Bombay status as a modern metropolis. So these kind of twinned synchronic journeys uh, of cotton and cinema also have very deep material connections. Now, cotton futures trading, so speculative trading on cotton uh, stocks and options in Bombay got a phenomenal boost during the 1860s with the American Civil War because the cotton exports from the US to England stopped during the war. England turned to India to supply its textile factories with raw cotton. And this is when Bombay started to rise as the foremost industrial and financial center of South Asia. And this is closely linked with what was called in the 1860s a cotton mania, when the phenomenal flow of gold into Bombay presidency that came from this very abnormal kind of price escalation of cotton because of the American Civil War, it sent the city temporarily mad. And I'm quoting here from Times of India articles of the time, talking about cotton mania, people going crazy because of the high prices of cotton stocks. So huge amounts of profits in gold entered Bombay at this time, and it spurred a lot of new growth. Anyone familiar with the history of the city knows how important this in, in the cash and credit inflow was to real estate, the textile industry, and infrastructural development. A lot of the most iconic um, buildings um, in Bombay uh, and philanthropic institutions started to be set up at this time. But this was a short-lived bubble. And after that cotton mania, there was a major crash when the American Civil War ended in 1865. And there was a lot of financial devastation. A lot of people went bankrupt. And the city was really haunted by, by the stock crash for a long, long time. But the city's appetite for speculation revived very quickly. And since then, there have been periodic booms and busts, um, especially during the First World War in 1925, in 1935, and then again during the Second World War. A lot of speculative finance flooded Bombay in these years. And here's where cinema comes back into the picture. A lot of cinema performed a very important kind of channel for rerouting a lot of the speculative finance as film entrepreneurs started to look for investors for a business of filmmaking, which was still quite new and many considered it very highly risky. Nobody knew what the future was going to be of this fledgling um, art and financial form. Now, the film industry was exceptionally undercapitalized and underfunded at this time. And this is a story of Bollywood in many ways. For many, many years, uh, no financial institution wanted to touch it with a barge pole in terms of actually providing a capital. And the colonial government was completely uninterested in financing. Um, uh, cinema and local filmmaking. They were more interested in promoting British cinema that was made in England uh, and exporting it to India. So the British government's main interest actually in cinema, Indian made Indian cinema was through censorship. Their main interest was in controlling the content of Indian films uh, through routine and very strict censorship uh, because they were wanted to be very careful about the possibility of any anti-colonial or anti-British messaging that could incite people um, into uh, revolting against the colonial administration. So while this entire focus of the colonial eye was directed at the content of films and uh, the final image on the screen, the colonial administration was not attuned at all to the financial and industrial um, negotiations that were taking place. So the colonial government was also at the same time very closely surveilling the cotton speculation um, economy, very closely monitoring cotton trading 
and had started to criminalize local speculative practices like satta. So because the financial aspects of filmmaking were neglected by the government, film production became a very important and unregulated space of opportunity where local cotton traders could start to move their cash and their credit outside of the surveillance of the colonial admin. So Bombay Cineecology came to become very closely connected to the local cotton economy in the Bombay city and Bombay presidency region. And a lot of initial capital investment came from Gujarati and Marwari credit and cotton merchants. One of Bombay's oldest film studios, Kohinoor Film Company, which was established in 1919. I don't have an image of, of Kohinoor Film Company, but I'm gonna discuss some of these other studios. Now, Kohinoor was started by a local cotton mill owner, Dwarka Das Sampat. Similarly, for Krishna Film Company, um, Ishwar Lal Umed Bhai Patel, who already had uh, investments in the cotton industry, used his cotton profits to promote Krishna Film Company, and then moved into film finance and film distribution in the 1930s. Even the legendary Bombay Talkie Studio received financial backing in its early years from the cotton merchant turned theosophist Jamna Das Dwarka Das, who was offered a 30% share of the profits in Bombay Talkie's films. So the studio that we saw in Malad, which still exists today, was built on the property of Effie Dinshaw, who had made his own fortunes from the Bombay cotton industry. And he was also on the Bombay Talkies board of directors. So we start to see so much of the initial heavy capital investment for setting up film studios, which are quite expensive propositions. You need buildings, you need equipment, you need to hire employees, you need to train them. Um, and celluloid and film equipment were all imported. There were none of these things were locally manufactured. So huge amount of investment required just to set up a film studio. So a lot of this initial investment came from, from the cotton economy. Now, apart from these heavy initial investments, Bombay Cinema was also financed by short-term profits from cotton speculation. Local mercantile networks picked on film as an avenue for offloading unreported and untaxed incomes from speculative and other trade. And many of you are aware of the importance of what was called black money in the 1980s, for example, in Bombay cinema. So this is a different kind of an early moment where a lot of unreported uh, cash was very crucial to building and developing the film industry. So the economically unobtrusive and governmentally neglected film industry became a logical venue for a different kind of futures trading. So it's possible to see investment in film also as a very speculative kind of an investment because filmmaking was then and still remains today a massively risky commercial proposition. No one has ever been able to predict a formula that will guarantee a hit film. And if anyone could do that prediction, they would be billionaires. Due to the very huge financial costs and the time required to make one single picture, the risk potential of film as business is singularly high. But profits, when generated, can also be similarly exponential. And so a lot of uh, investors who are very um, risk friendly right, who are very attuned to or attracted to this very high stakes game of being able to have very high profits at the risk of high losses, started to then uh, move into um, film investment. Just to give you a sense of what films cost to make at this time, in the late 1930s, a Bombay film on average cost 70,000 rupees to produce. And it could be expected in a, on a good day, in a good week, in a good month, to bring returns of up to 500,000 rupees. So in 70,000, you could make 500,000. So these ratios obviously made film production a very lucrative, if risky, venture for short-term investors. So what I'm trying to show is that the relationship between cinema and cotton was very mutually beneficial. If cinema needed the finances from Bombay Cotton, then Cotton Futures Trading needed Bombay Cinema to reroute its investments. And speculative finance had become so commonplace and such a mainstay of film production by the 1940s 
that the very famous and controversial film journalist Babura Patel reminded his readers, the readers of his, his popular magazine, Film India, in 1945, that in the course of 30 years, through the routine evolution of mortgages, the early speculating financiers came to be known as studio owners and incidentally as the producers. Even though they produce pictures on their own, their profit motive remains paramount. So Babura Patel is being extremely sarcastic here because he's, he's, he's basically criticizing the motivations of a lot of producers for making films. And his argument in the larger article is that instead of being driven by the principles of art and storytelling, many people are driven by the principles of commerce. And of course, this is only one partial part of the story because it's possible, as many of you know, that one can approach film as simultaneously business, commerce, art, culture, um, education, and entertainment. Now, I want to turn to some of the films that were made at this time, which made financial risk a very key subject itself for storytelling. Now, Asya Siddiqui, uh, some of you might know uh, her book on Bombay's peoples, has recently shown that fears of bankruptcy and insolvency affected a wide cross-section of Bombay's population, not just the business elite. All manner of middle and working class men and women traded at the local peris, the street corners, the betting stalls and gaming houses, wagering on everything from dog and horse races to cotton and opium market prices, and even the quantity of monsoon rainfall was something that you could wager on. So gambling had become a matter of major public concern and a lot of politicians and, and social workers were very much upset and disturbed by this gambling uh, becoming such an everyday culture of Bombay life. And so films that were made in this time started to also reference these same anxieties and these same concerns. So I'm just going to take you through a few films that were made at this time that very centrally deal with the topic of gambling and financial speculation. So a film like Throw of Dice, uh, which is made in 1929, this is not made in Bombay, but it just helps us remember how important the gambling trope has been to a South Asian imagination through the popular um, Hindu mythological epic, the Mahabharata with a very central episode of the, uh, the dice game. So this gambling as a very important dramatic device that can generate very epic conflicts and battles is already a very much part of a South Asian imagination. And in the 30s and 40s, it gets transformed into very modern and contemporary form um, that revealed many different attitudes towards gambling and speculation. So a film like Ghar Ki Laj, is basically about how a young man uh, squanders all his family wealth uh, in, through gambling and all the suffering that his wife, um, played by Shanta Hublikar, has to then um, go through in order to keep her family and her children alive. So many films deal with the tragedy then of financial ruin through gambling and loss of wealth. And they become kinds of cautionary tales. They try to educate audiences about the dangers of gambling. So often like Do Ghari Ki Moj, right? It's talking about how ephemeral it is to spend two moments of, of, of pleasure in gambling. And those two moments can lead to a lifetime of devastation. A film like Always Tell Your Wife by Bombay Talkies is not a tragic film like many of these are. It's actually a comedy that uh, still is about um, a gambling fixation that a husband has, who basically lies to his wife, Devika Rani, saying he's going on a business trip, but he actually takes a boat from Gateway of India towards Elephanta and uh, basically meets up with some friends on that ship uh, to gamble. And the ship sinks um, and everyone on, in, in the city thinks that he's dead. And then he, when he returns, uh, there's a lot of comedy of confusion where people think he's a ghost, he suspects that his wife is now in love with another man. So through comedy, again, this film is doing a similar kind of caution about what, um, what are the harms of gambling. Now, while presenting these stories as cautionary tales, 
It's also obvious that these films are also presenting gambling and speculation as a kind of entertainment of its own, which merits also viewing as an exciting subject for filmy drama. Now, what's interesting is that a number of films that were made at this time are not just about gambling as say, uh, 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 betting with cards or on horse races, but are very directly about the stock market. So the rise is about the rise and fall of share prices on the stock market. And actually this is one of the rare films where the hero, the protagonist is a successful and a good stock broker. In most of these films, stockbrokers are villains, but this is one rare film where, where he's a good guy and he's actually using his skill with uh, trading um, for good. Adhuri Kahani starring uh, Prithvi Raj Kapoor and Durga Kote is again a, a tragedy where because of gambling and speculation an entire family is destroyed. The father commits suicide, the sister commits suicide and uh, everything spirals out of control. Now, this film, Double Cross, is a different genre, but also dealing with the same question. It's a detective thriller, and it's about stockbrokers and even market manipulators who create an artificially generated stock market crash. Um, it's very interesting. It features the hero, um, is a, is a, the, one of the protagonists is a scientist called Professor Mukherjee, no relation of mine who discovers a formula for manufacturing artificial diamonds, synthetic diamonds. And the antagonist tries to engineer a, um, a stock crash for the shares of an, a company called Orient Diamond Mines. So that when the Orient Diamond Mines company uh, um, uh, crashes, these artificially made diamonds could serve to set up a new company that would fill in a different vacuum. So very complicated kind of financial plot, uh, which would not be possible unless there was an assumption that there was a large, large understanding amongst the viewing public of these, the, the intricacies of stock markets and so on. Now, another film called um, Adhuri Kahani that I talked about, uh, the uh, uh, Seth Gopaldas, the father, is a cotton merchant and he loses all his wealth in the Satta Bazaar. So what I'm trying to say is that the intricacies of such plots draw also on what's actually happening in Bombay at that time. And that's visible in the routine newspaper reportage about stock market uh, panics, lawsuits, scandals, suicides involving brokers and speculators, stockbrokers suing Maharajas, uh, film producers accused of murdering share brokers, stories of forged checks. So Bombay's newspapers, if you look at it at this time in the 30s, are completely inflamed with sensational stories about uh, stocks and shares and, and crashes and speculation, stories that start to blur the division between the real and the fictional, right? Between the sensation of newspaper reportage and the sensationist films that were also being made at the same time on the same topics. So Bombay cinema was therefore very much grounded in the interests and the activities of its local audiences. And we start to see this in a new kind of film characters that start to emerge for the first time as villains in the 1930s. New kinds of social actors such as gamblers, stockbrokers, insurance agents, Teji Mandi speculators, race betters and bankers. So creditors, for example, suddenly become a new kind of villain um, in films like, say, um, A New Searchlight and Matlabi Dunya, right? These are stories that are premised on the main kind of dramatic conflict arises out of sick loans, debt, and desperation. And the film antagonists in this time are not people that are interested in, in women and wine, rather, they're all interested in paper and documents. They are called crooks, swindlers, forgers, blackmailers, fraudsters. And their chief motive in these films is to lay their hands on signed bonds of trust, wills, shares, promissory notes, insurance policies, and checks. So what this helps us understand is how important 
this kind of financial imagination was to Bombay at this time and how important it became for Bombay cinema to directly address this and produce new kinds of stock characters and stock villains who are unlike the kinds of villains one would imagine in the 1930s. They're not evil zamindars necessarily. They are evil stockbrokers and forgers. It's very, very fascinating. So filmic fictions about finance then drew on popular perceptions about financial matters. Um, and Bombay cinema now had to create protagonists, a new kind of hero or a new kind of heroine that could defeat this new kind of villain. And here is where we see a film like Red Signal. I just love this poster. Those of you that follow me on Instagram saw that I posted this image yesterday. Red Signal um, is, is a, um, a, a heroine centric film and the, the, the actress Urmila plays the character Red Signal who is a masked Avenger. And uh, she sets out to rid, to free the city of the evil of, um, of, of speculators, gamblers and gambling dens. So very, very interesting. The emergence also a new kind of protagonist to uh, quell this evil. So I want to move now from this whole discussion of finance, cotton and speculation to the next topic, which is on labor. And here I will focus my discussion on one specific film, which had the dual language title Mill and in Hindi, Mazdoor. It uh, was a highly anticipated film. It was released in Bombay in 1939. And it was written by the acclaimed Hindi novelist Prem Chand and directed by the veteran uh, filmmaker Mohan Bhavnani. Now this film's topic was also very topical and very, very important to Bombay. It's a love story between the daughter of a mill owner and a trade union leader. So um, played by Bibbo and Jairaj. And in through the love story, the film tries to present a solution, a romantic solution to a problem that had plagued Bombay at least since the 1920s, the long history of labor agitations and, uh, and class struggle. Now, an advertisement in the Bombay Chronicle newspaper claimed that for the first time on the Indian screen, there was going to be a picture that deals with the lives of two lakhs of citizens of Bombay. So for the Bombay release, the ads were very specifically saying, this is a Bombay film, it's been made for Bombay's audiences who are rather numerous, even at the time, two lakhs. So what's remarkable for me is that the film releases in Bombay in 1939, but it has actually released in the rest of British India in 1934. So five years before this Bombay release. Now, what happened was that for five years, between 1934 and 1939, the Bombay film censors kept stalling the film, kept requesting more and more cuts, and they finally banned the film. It's only when in 1939, um, a, a Congress government, uh, was finally able to take over for the first time from the British administration that the ban was reversed and Mill was able to be released um, in Bombay. So this is why it took five years. People in Lahore, for example, saw the film in 1934. The people in Bombay were not able to see it for uh, five more years. So the Bombay Board of Film Certification, the Bombay Censor Board claimed that Bombay City offered some peculiar uh, features in its current industrial climate that made it necessary to prevent the screening of films like The Mill. So here we see a linked history of a film and the place in which it is censored, which again points to some local fears and tensions, which can tell us something very interesting again about the relationship between cinema and the city. Now, many of you know that film production emerged in India during the uh, British colonial era and we can say that India's multiple film industries today have inherited censorship as a kind of bequest from the colonial era. Uh, many, many laws in contemporary post-colonial India are direct kind of throwbacks to the colonial era, which is why there continue to be so many debates even today about what is the value and purpose uh, and extent of film censorship even today. Now, what's important here to remember is that in this time, in the 1930s, 
the censor boards were very localized boards and each presidency had its own censor board and there was no centralized uh, certification body like there is today. So independent local police commissioners were able to decide if a film could be released or not released in that presidency, which is why the Bombay Censor Board could have a decision very from the Punjab Censor Board or the, or the Bengal Censor Board. So the question then is what was it that was so unsuitable, so inflammatory about Mill that was so specific to Bombay? Now, important for me to remind you that this film is considered a lost film today. Like most of the films, at least 95% of the films made in the 20s and 30s and even early 40s are considered lost films. They don't exist in the National Film Archives of India. And uh, many experts believe that we will never be able to see these films. But we can still reconstruct the stories of these films from many sources including film reviews, song booklets, and very importantly, censorship records. So the story of Mill is about a textile mill owner, uh, Seth Hansraj, who is on his deathbed. And before he dies, he um, equally bequeaths his factory, uh, and he makes his son and his daughter equal partners in his uh, textile factory. Now, his daughter is a woman called Padma, played by Bibbo, who is a very dutiful and a progressive um, person. But the son, uh, played by Nayampali, is, is the villain of the piece. And he is this very debauched and profligate character who's only interested in squandering his father's money on uh, women, on alcohol, and of course, on gambling. Now, before dying, uh, he leaves the factory to both of them. But at this time, the mill workers are also very agitated and restless. Their wages have been lowered, their working hours have been increased, and retrenchment as a threat looms very large. Now, uh, the daughter falls in love now with a mill worker who then becomes the, uh, the leader of a strike that is going to happen. But Padma is a very progressive person. She agrees with the workers' demands, and she leads the mill workers in a peaceful strike against her own brother. So the story very clearly advocates for peaceful methods of protest. And Kailash and Padma, the lead character's love story, serves as a very obvious metaphor that it is possible for capital and labor relations to reach a compromise, that, there, that this is a divide that can be gulfed through some kind of progressive and empathetic thinking. Right? So it, it's making an argument for possibility of some kind of benevolent capitalism. So it's not a crazy anarchic film, but still the Bombay Censor Board was not concerned with the peaceful compromise at the closure of the film, but they were agitated by some negative depictions and some scenes in the film that for them were offensive. And these were scenes in which, uh, and these are examples that are very specifically given in the censorship records. Uh, so there are details there that the censor board says, you have to delete scenes in which female mill workers are being sexually harassed by the factory manager. You have to delete scenes in which the management has hired strike breakers to attack the employees. So their entire focus was to not have negative kinds of characterizations of factory owners and management. Now it's important to remember that strikes were a very daily reality in Bombay at this time, and many of these censored scenes were actually happening every day on the streets of Bombay and were being reported liberally again in the local newspapers. Now, the city's cotton industry employed thousands of workers, and they were getting more and more organized um, in, in their kind of struggle for better wages. Uh, you know, and I think Khaki Lab also uh, posted an Instagram post yesterday precisely about the activism of mill associations at this time in Bombay, including the right to have one day off in a week to get Sunday off, for example. So these are very current, very topical concerns, and they are all factual, but still the censor board objected to seeing these facts fictionalized in a more palatable form in film. And this is because the Mazdoor, as a kind of a new urban and social figure, had become a very resonant character in the city's imagination. Social workers, activists, politicians were very much um, advocating for the Mazdoor. 
So the question now becomes, so who did the censors think was going to watch the film, right? So clearly perhaps it was not the evil capitalists uh, that the film was portraying that were the primary audience. So this is a very crucial part of the puzzle. The urban proletariat comprised a major chunk of Bombay cinema's paying audiences. So the working class was basically the viewership that was bankrolling a very undercapitalized film industry in its earliest years. So not only was Mill set in Bombay and it was about Bombay's topical concerns, but its primary audiences were also located in the Bombay city and presidency area. And this is because Bombay had so many film theaters that were showing Indian films that it out, it's out surpassed many other cities across uh, South Asia in the sheer number of theaters and the sheer income that came in at these theaters uh, from exhibition. So just to give you a sense of the statistics, at this point, Bombay's film audiences in the nationwide theatrical revenue, Bombay's audiences contributed 33 to 47% of the national revenue share. So this is a hugely significant thing, which also helps you understand that these films were being made also very much for a very immediate and local audience. Another very important thing to remember is that film viewership, because it depended on working class audiences, uh, the theaters were also located in these neighborhoods, in cotton mill neighborhoods. So cotton mill districts, neighborhoods that were inhabited by film, um, this is just to give you a sense of the- Sorry uh, to interrupt, the industry. we are uh, 40 minutes in. Okay, Around so I'll, I'll, minutes in. I'll wrap up in about another 10, 15 minutes. So this is just to give you a sense of Jairaj and Bipu um, and show you some beautiful images of them. And then to return, there is a, a very kind of close spatial connection between the places where mill workers lived the places where studios uh, were set up and the places where theaters uh, started to be built to cater to these same audiences. And so Raj Narayan Chandavarkar has told us that from the late 19th century onwards, the city's poor began to drift from the high rents of native town to the villages of Parel, to Masgao, Tarwadi, Siuri, and Kamatipura. And the city's cotton mills were increasingly in the same area. So residential, um, chores, and um, the place of work were often in, in, a, in, a, in close proximity. And this is why a lot of exhibition uh, exhibitors and theater owners decided to set up Indian film theaters again in the same neighborhood. Now, while the working classes of Bombay were very major patrons of Hollywood stunt films, right? But these, this was in the silent period. With the arrival of sound and the talkies, which is the time that I'm interested in, you can imagine what a huge difference it would make to see a film in Hindi or Marathi uh, compared to watching a Hollywood film in English, which you might not really understand. It's not a language of the city. So Bombay silent and early talkie studios were then increasingly uh, located between Mazgao and Dadar. And in my book, I, I have this elaborate map to give you a sense of the high concentration of studios uh, and how they kept moving slowly, slowly upwards for various reasons, um, as we will discuss. But this area had become a very popular period by the, uh, in the 1930s for uh, the location of film studios. And Dadar was actually being called in the Western press. In America, Dadar was being called India's Little Hollywood in the silent period because of the number of studios that were concentrated there. So these neighborhood links help us understand that the cotton industry not only supplied finance, but also provided the earliest audiences for Indian cinema. And in turn, cinema offered Bombay's overworked and underpaid factory workers an escape from everyday drudgery, right? Through fantasies of alternate worlds and a place to relax for three or more hours. And films at this time were often very much longer than they are today. Now, um, I actually just wanna quickly move through this um, to give you an indication of exactly how nervous Bombay's censors were about adding to uh, proletarian and working class um, 
um, emotions against the capitalist economy that a very famous film like Metropolis that was made in 1927, even Metropolis was banned in Bombay in the 1930s because Metropolis managed to get to India by 1932 and it was banned and this is what they said. It, and I'm quoting from the censor records. Metropolis deals with the conflict between labor and capital and class hatred and depicts many mob scenes. So again, a very similar kind of a fear and a fear very much about Bombay's audiences rather than some kind of cross South Asia uh, anxiety. Now, I wanted to just quickly also tell you that this kind of an interest in mills, mill workers, strikes, uh, also created many other films, became a template for many other films. This is a very interesting film called Industrial India made by the director Mohan Bhavnani. And it was also shot just like Mill was shot. It was shot in actually existing factories in Bombay. And it was advertised as such. So there was a major kind of publicity blitz that came out in a special supplement in the Times of India in 1938, where the ads were just about, look, this is the Patanwala's um, a factory where the famous Afghan snow is made and the film has shot, been shot there. So you can see this factory in our film, right? Again, it says Golden Tobacco Company, which has these amazing machines that can make thousands, I mean, eight lakh cigarettes a day. We have shot in this factory and you can see this um, in our film. So these films are presenting Bombay's industrial status, its indigenous and its Swadeshi factories, and it's also nationalist time, right? So it's Swadeshi factories are becoming the main attraction for films sometimes bigger than the stars or the songs, right? These actual locations and factories. And it helps us also remember how important real locations in Bombay, locations of labor and work have been to cinema, perhaps not so much in recent years, but definitely very important through the 70s. For example, with the resurgence of the angry young, the arrival of the angry young man figure with Amita Bachchan, where from the factory we moved to the dockyard as a kind of a site very crucial to Bombay's labor struggles and its industrial history. So with that, I want to move to the last portion of my talk. Just want to briefly talk about the monsoon. It's monsoon season in Bombay. For those of you that are lucky to be in Bombay right now, unlike myself. Um, and I wanted to think a little bit about the relationship between monsoon also and cinema. Now, uh, the seasons and climate are often considered to be purely natural phenomena, right? Not cultural phenomena. We study climate using scientific tools and logics, but what if we consider a cultural history of climate, right? And what I'm saying is what are the emotions, the behaviors and the everyday human responses to the monsoon in Bombay? And what is the relationship between cinema and the monsoon? Now the monsoon is a socio-cultural event which is saturated with symbolic meaning. It is a multi-sensory and durational weather phenomenon. The body registers it as light, as sound, as texture, as color. And each of these sensory experiences is deeply laden with cultural meaning. Lightning, thunder, gray clouds, darkened skies, humidity, a strong breeze. Each of these experiences can trigger a range of moods from joy to relief, to trepidation and anxiety. And in South Asian classical and folk traditions, the monsoon has been visualized repeatedly through iconic tropes such as dark clouds, as you can see here, green foliage and lightning. The monsoon is also deeply associated with the Ras Leela or the divine dance of the cowherd god Krishna and his paramours. So the rains in these images create an environment that is soaked with Sringaras, that is the texture of the erotic. So many of these ideas from art forms like painting, music, poetry, literature have migrated quite freely into cinema as you're all uh, well aware. So just to give you a sense of the importance of some visual tropes, clouds um, and associated with a certain feeling. But the monsoon is also a cinematic trope very famously in Bombay cinema. And it's almost impossible today to imagine Bombay films without the use of rain as a kind of a key character or a very important mood 
to indicate some kind of mood shift uh, in a climactic moment in a film or to indicate the experience of living in a specific kind of city, a city by the sea. So the monsoon is what I'm trying to say is it's a cultural and a historical subject as well. Um, but in my book, I wasn't so interested in, in representations of the monsoon in cinema, but I was interested in what did the monsoon do to film production practices um, in, in Bombay. And from a film production perspective, the monsoon starts to become a visible player when things start to break down. And the seasonal Indian summer monsoon always ushers in dramatic forms of breakdown. And here I want to share with you a very interesting memoir by a German Jewish exile called Wilhelm Haas, Willy Haas, who had moved to Bombay in the 1930s, um, fleeing Nazi persecution. And he actually was working with Mohan Bhavnani, the same director and producer of The Mill. And he wrote memoirs in German, in German many years later. And he describes in one passage how he arrived in Bombay and the first day that he tried to get to Bhavnani's office from Churchgate to Dadar. And he said that the monsoon, though delayed, had descended upon the country with unimaginable violence, right? There was massive volume of water. It spewed its contents toward the sky in meter high fountains. I was not deterred. I made my way to the nearby church gate station, but I didn't make it even though it was a five minute walk. Church gate street had transformed into a powerful river, right? And he says it took him four hours to get from church gate to Dadar. And when he gets there, Bhavnani laughs at him and says, why did you even bother <laughs> right? making this kind of epic journey? So what I'm trying to say is that the onset of the monsoon in a coastal metropolis like Bombay has a very fierce impact on the city's experience of time and space, right? A five minute walk becomes a four hour epic journey. Urban infrastructures start to crumble. The drainage system breaks down. The railway station is flooded. The tram and local train network starts to collapse. And this is obviously familiar to you today in Mumbai where the monsoon is having that kind of infrastructural impact and with climate change, its effects are creating greater and greater havoc uh, every monsoon season. But in the 1930s, film studios were also affected by this and often employees just couldn't get to work. So film studios started to accommodate the monsoon season in their pre-production and the production schedules and their timetables, factoring in all these disruptions that could happen. Now, um, just to quickly kind of share with you a very important uh, set of work by a scholar, Brian Jacobson, who has done a lot of work on thinking about studios as material, physical places of work and how they emerged. He looks at the France and the American context, but it's useful that he points out that often in the 1910s, in the silent period, even in Europe, Studios were not just a place to make films, they were a place to keep the weather out, to keep the work going uninterrupted and to provide protection from the natural elements like harsh uh, sun, heat, rain, um, and snow in many places. And in Bombay, the introduction of sound also led to a great need for this kind of environmental control. The so studio was being seen as a place to insulate the inside from the outside and the need for sound insulation became very important. And it's a very interesting paradox that with the arrival of talkies and sound cinema, films started to need in their making, in their production, greater and greater silence so that dialogues, music, song could be recorded in a very clean track without any noise and disturbance from the outside world. Now, this question of the need for silence is also an infrastructural question that is linked to finance and funding. So as I've already said, that the film industry at this time was very undercapitalized with very, very limited resources. We have made some very remarkable films actually at this time. So many studios didn't have the money or the technology to soundproof their studios. So instead of spending money on soundproofing, they just started to relocate their studios to quieter parts of town. So as the city kept growing, right, um, uh, northwards, as I'd shown you in that map, 
and the suburbs are always quieter right than the commercial parts of the city so the film ecology started to move from dadar which at that time had become already very congested very noisy a huge kind of trade and commercial hub around dadar railway station and started to move further up which is why bombay talk is set up in malad which at that time was still considered very forested rural kind of a place with very uh, limited kind of urbanization so the need for silence also starts moving studios northward along with urban sprawl um and so the monsoon had an impact also on sound recording because many studios had roofs that were made of tin and any little bit of rain created a deafening kind of a clatter so some studios also wanted to shoot scenes that were rain scenes and rain sequences and bombay talkies which actually had far more resources than many of the studios had this very remarkable and you can't see it so clearly but i wanted to show you it's a completely indoor set um it's meant to be the terrace of a um of an apartment this film called bhabhi you can actually watch it on youtube um the camera is here and it's exposing a city backdrop that is painted over here in the background as a kind of a natural view of the city and there are these upturned shower heads over here which are creating artificial rain as you can see so alongside the creation of this very controlled artificial rain a real rain outside is also creating a lot of havoc so um in the interest of time i'm just going to rush through this um bombay talkies had often very considerable budgets uh, and technologies for doing very controlled shoots but many other film companies that didn't have such budgets but wanted to shoot in the rain make use of rain sequences uh just sent their crews outside to shoot right so a lot of the cheaper kind of film genres like the stunt film which were often very cheaply made um often did that just send cast and crews out into the world to shoot and here there was a very interesting case about a famous actress many of you might know called pramila um whose real name is esther abraham uh, these are images of her from a film called bijli uh, and she started a career in stunt films she was a very popular stunt actress doing all kinds of daredevil feats but in 1939 when she was um rehearsing a scene for a film called jungle king she almost drowned now that drowning became a very important thing for me to really unpack and if you read that chapter in my book i i go into it in a lot of detail that i can't do today but basically at a particular point she's wearing this tiger skin costume and she is um swimming in uh, uh near ghorbandar fort and she starts to get sucked under by the heavy currents but the crew that shooting the scene doesn't realize that she's actually calling for help and they instead say kya scene tha they congratulate her for her very realistic acting now this is where their studio used to be so wadia movie tone was a company at the time and wadia movie tone later switched hands to shantaram's rajkamal studio but this is where the studio was and they went all the way here to shoot this outdoor scene now what's very interesting is that uh, the river that she's talking about is the ulhas river where she nearly drowned because of the strong currents and she could have flown directly into the arabian sea but the ulhas river is not such a resplendent and a filmy river of love like a prem prem ki nadi uh, it's only oh, it's only gushing like that in the monsoon because it's a monsoon fed river in every other season um it's it's quite dry you would definitely not drown in the ulhas river in those years um if it was in any other season apart from the monsoon so here what i'm trying to say is that um very important to think about the climate of a place seasonal phenomena like monsoon and the role that they played in the lives and the work experiences the subjects and the topics of filmmaking uh, from a particular place today we take it for granted that uh, oh bombay films are going to have rain but these are such certain kind of templates and tropes that were produced in these early years so i will just conclude here uh, to basically say that some of the questions that i've tried to raise in my book and in this talk 
are about the many ways in which Bombay city is deeply entangled with the movies that were made here. And I wasn't interested in telling a story of male pioneers or legendary studios. I was interested in the book in talking about how a place and a film form become very totally enmeshed. How does a film industry grow in a city where the monsoon really lashes the city for three months every year? Where does this volatile and very capital intensive business find finances in a time when banks are not going to touch it and nor will the colonial government? And what did any of this have to do with a region that was famous for its cotton trade? So for me, the term ecology has given me a way to understand that the whole space of film production is a very flexible and organic space, which is continually shape-shifting. It's not got any fixed boundaries, and you can't say that the film industry is just located in one studio or in one part of town, right? If you track all these practices, indoor shooting, outdoor shooting, where do the audiences live? Where do they work? This entire cine ecology becomes much larger than one studio, and it starts to overlap completely with the parameters and the perimeters of Bombay City. So I just want to end with saying that this is a production of the city itself as a kind of studio, the city as a kind of factory floor, where the workers of film are joined by other entities like weather uh, and topography, cotton speculators and mazdoors. And you can hate Bombay cinema or you can love it, but you can't take it out of Bombay city. So with that, I end. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Devashree. That was absolutely amazing. The amount of research, those connections that you made, uh, not something that we generally think about and the compliments are just flowing in. A uh, lot of people have appreciated the level of detail and the connections. So I'll just resolve one of their queries right away. Where is this book available? You can go and look it up on Amazon. It's there and you can get the paperback copy by tomorrow if you order it now. So it's much. Yeah, and I, I just want to kind of mention that um, it's it's a it's a I'm, I tried to make sure that the India edition was a reasonably priced edition. These are not US prices. I think the book should be available to you for for six hundred rupees. Yeah, and I hope if it's not affordable, please write to me and I can send you. Um, I can find other other ways for you to read it. Thank you so much. And there are a couple of questions. Uh, uh, shall we just take them up? Sure. Yeah. Uh, so Farooq would like to uh, get a brief overview from you about film journalism in the 1930s to 50s. You showed us a few glimpses of it. But if you can share a couple of more insights. Yeah, so um, actually my entire um, um, Publication history, the, the, my entire like writing about films in this time started with writing about journalism. And there are, there are two main reasons for this. One is that when you're dealing with films that from such a long time ago, where the films often don't exist, it's really quite a tragedy and a shame in terms of a loss, again, because of Khaki Lab's focus on heritage, the loss of a lot of cinematic heritage. But then you start to see that there are many other places where cinema continues to exist. And that is often in film journalism. So a lot, so from the moment that films became popular with Indian audiences, people started writing about what they meant, what is their significance, and started to think about these, the, the very classic film critic kind of concerns. What is a good film? What is a bad film? Um, so in the 1930s, film journalism in Bombay explodes. There are numerous film magazines that are being printed. So like Cinema Sansar that I showed you with the American Cotton Futures is like a pamphlet. Its, paper, its pages are like tissue paper. So it's a very cheap kind of a booklet printed in Hindi, but it's catering to a very uh, interested uh, public, which I call cinema's reading publics. So cinema has viewing publics, it also has a very excited reading public. But at the same time, you also have a magazine like Film India, which also starts at, at this time, uh, which becomes the biggest sensation. Uh, and I've written about Film India uh, as the most popular English language film magazine of the time, which could make and break careers, whose editor, Babura Patel, um, uh, whose, whose home and office 
his home and office with uh, Sushila Rani Patel used to still exist in in Pali Hill in Bandra called Girnar till a few years ago. I haven't been so recently yet. I don't know. But uh, he was a huge personage. He had cast himself as a kind of a celebrity star maker, star breaker. He used to write very controversial and scandalous kind of comments and kind of begins this kind of gossip journalism uh, that we see so common today. But his, he had a very clear agenda about thinking about the morality and the artistic value of films. So he would write a lot of editorials about that. And I've also written about um, newspaper journalism. So the Times of India was a very establishment, yeah, pro-colonial pro establishment kind of a paper that catered often to British and Anglo-Indian uh, readers. And it refused to carry any reviews of Indian films for a very, very long time. And Bombay Chronicle newspaper, which used, which used to be where the Bombay Samachar offices are in um, Horniman Circle, um, Bombay Chronicle took the lead in publishing film reviews for Indian films. So you have to remember that 1930s is a time when there's a huge number of Hollywood films that are also being screened alongside Indian films and alongside sometimes European films that are coming in, like Metropolis was screened in Bombay at some point, right? So there's a lot of journalism happening in newspapers and in magazines. And uh, Khwaja Ahmed Abbas is the kind of very important film critic for Bombay Chronicle. And he brings his own socialist kind of leftist viewpoint to judging films. So I've written an article about the different agendas and politics that different critics brought to film at this time, because they were all trying to think that we are working towards an independent India, right? And an independent India needs a particular kind of uplifting independent cinema. And we are planning, like we're planning industries, we're planning a better future. We have to plan for a better cinema. So those concerns became very important to what parameters are used for judging films even today. Thank you for that. Another related question and taking up bits from what you said, when did the movie start going to uh, the Mirch Masala pot boilers from these very purpose-driven films that you spoke about? They were always Mirch Masala. And so they Potter. always coexisted. Yeah, so there's always been a variety of artistic aspirations that filmmakers have had. And one has to remember, and this is something I try to stress in my book, films, Indian films don't come out of a vacuum. They are coming out at a time, so in the 1920s, when films really started to take off in Bombay. Bombay is also a very important entertainment hub. There are many kinds of other entertainments that are available for people. Most importantly, one would say Parsi theater, right? So Parsi theater provides the first workforce for Hindi talkie films. Because when you move from silent to talkie, you ask, where will I get a dialogue writer? There is no such thing as a dialogue writer in cinema before this. Where will I get a music composer? Where will I get a lyricist? We've never needed lyricists for films before the 1930s, right? And Parsi Theatre had all of, all of these people. And Parsi Theatre did a lot of very epic, very hyperbolic, very kind of potboiler style um, performance, choreography, acting. Uh, and it took some time for Bombay cinema to tone some of that down. Um, and the talkie period in the 1930s actually sees a lot of interest in trying to do a fine balance between a lot of masala stuff um, but alongside interest in social reform questions. So all these studios, Bombay Talkies, Ranjit Movie Tone, Sagar Movie Tone. I talk about Ranjit and Sagar in my book quite a bit. Um, even Vadya Movie Tone. They're very interested in, in taking up questions about caste, class, gender, widowry, marriage, alcoholism, gambling. But they all try to negotiate with the entertainment factor in different ways. Uh, so yeah, we've, we've, it, the story is not that our cinema has become corrupted and once it was pure, right? Entertaining has always been a very important motivation uh, for film and a very important emotional sustenance, I think, for people. So these things have always coexisted. You uh, mentioned that sadly most of these films don't survive anymore. You mentioned one that does and is available on YouTube. So one of our viewers wants to know whether any of the other movies you spoke about is available. 
Yeah, so I would, I always love to share this website. I'm just typing it in the chat, www.indiancine.na. Um, so this is a kind of an open source, um, uh, copyright free kind of an um, project that was set up by some people in Bombay actually to, um, to make a lot of uh, copyright free films, films that were public made 60 years before today to make them available to the public for free. So you'll see a lot of early films there and I've actually annotated in detail um, three, three or more films from Bombay Talkies. Very beautiful print copies, they're all subtitled and I have made detailed notes about particular scenes, particular costumes, particular actors that you see in the film. So I would urge you to check out this website. And I'm typing in the names of the films that I have annotated in case you wanted more background about what you were watching. Uh, and I'll continue with the questions, Devishri. Yeah, uh, yeah. Lots of compliments again, uh, but that is a given. Uh, talks about, uh, uh, Faiza says that it blows her mind that the early villains were stockbrokers and not the smugglers and jamindars of the movies that she grew up with. <laughs> No, I, uh, it's totally mind blowing for me too. And I think this is a very important that you mentioned smugglers, right? Because at which point in which decade do we see smugglers becoming the villains in Bombay? That becomes a very important kind of an index. It gives you a glimpse about what was actually happening in Bombay at which time, right? When do you see mafia dons becoming the villains or even the heroes, right? When do you see uh, slum lords or gangsters becoming heroes? These are all very deeply connected to what's actually concerning the people of Bombay. So in that sense, Bombay cinema really has always had a pulse for the people and their desires, their anxieties. So it's a very good index if you're coming from a social historian point of view of also understanding, getting a kind of a more um, emotional understanding of what was happening on the ground um, in that time. So I'm going to read out one comment which really sums it all up. Such, uh, Sanchidanan says, um, to place cinema evolution through its wondrous elements was just wonderful. Cottons and futures, labor themes based on rain, and tackles the important speculation phase. I think he said it all. Uh, he sort of summed up your whole uh, uh, talk, so to speak. Uh, Sangeeta says the Meerut conspiracy case of 1933. Uh, relating to the Bombay trade unions getting assistance from Manchester and Glasgow. Um, would you like to talk a little bit about that? Was it a not noteworthy film in your uh, experience? No, so uh, that's why I, so I've written an article about Mill and it's also available if you Google it um, as a free PDF. And, it's, and I wrote this entire article about one film and I don't generally spend so many words on one film. But it's because it's such a fascinating story and it allows me to talk about so many things. So the Merit conspiracy case is definitely very, very important because one of the things that was the reason for why the Bombay censors were so jumpy about a film like Mill is because of the growing kind of influence of the Communist Party, which was headquartered in Bombay at that time and then was outlawed, right? And a lot of these conspiracy trials were basically anti-communist kind of trials, uh, which were part of a kind of a global um, paranoia, because a lot of the communist internationalists were also fundamentally anti-imperialists. Mm -hmm. So they were calling not just for um, uh, the downfall of capitalism, they were calling for the downfall of imperialism, right? So they had to be um, uh, silenced in different ways. And, they, and the communist party was banned and so on, had to go underground. And this is true, Bhavnani was, uh, so Bhavnani actually had spent a lot of time abroad in England. Um, I'd be curious to know more about the exact Manchester connection. I was in touch with his daughter-in-law, Mitzi Bhavnani, who says she's trying to write uh, uh, a biography of Mohan Bhavnani and his very incredible wife, Inakshi Rama Rao one of the first actresses and dancers um, of, of India who also really popularized a lot of Indian uh, classical and folk dance forms as a performer. So very interesting story there. And I'm very intrigued also by his German connection because 
he actively brought people from Europe, provided work in, in uh, Bombay at a time when people, the Jewish peoples who had to flee persecution. So we know about how many German exiles moved to Hollywood in the 1930s, right? And a genre like film noir is completely indebted to these German exiles because it uses German expression as um, uh, um, aesthetics. But we don't know so much about this eastward migration that German exiles also had a role in Indian filmmaking. So Bhavnani is a very, very important character there. So there's a lot of Sangeeta, I agree with you here. And maybe in that article, you'll see me pull out some of those, those other things as well. Um, you showed at least two pic uh, posters of a woman who was sort of, I thought, modeled on fearless Nadia. Was that a, a, a important genre in the 30s? So the stunt and, film is, yeah, no, go ahead. And, and, and what did it have to do about the role of women in that, peri in that period? So my entire obsession with this period is about the role of women <laughs> in this period. And my entire interest actually starts with a, a great interest in actresses. Um, and more broadly, women as film practitioners and film professionals and how uh, they've been kind of written out of the history of Bombay cinema and except occasionally in some nostalgia about glamorous actresses. But we rarely talk about how fundamental actresses were to consolidating or building the film industry. You would not have this enterprise if it weren't for, the, the, for actresses and their work. So stunt films were a very important genre. Uh, they started to become popular in Bombay um, through Hollywood. So in the silent period, Hollywood would send, make a lot of um, stunt serials, which are short films that came out like television as episodes. So you can go to Regal today and watch part one of The Perils of Pauline. Then you have to wait another week and then you watch part two. And you know, if you miss it, then you have to go to a second run theater and see, okay, maybe there, there I can go back and watch that episode and so on. So these stunts here has popularized this kind of action, um, interest in action and stunts. And they often already had women uh, as the main protagonists. And if you read the memoirs of J.B.H. Wadia, a Wadia movie tone, he talks about how influential stunt films were him and his younger brother, Homi. Uh, and they were thrilled they, as schoolboys. They would run, skip school and go and sit in the front rows, which at that time were wooden benches. They weren't chairs. The chairs were for the slightly more expensive seats. And they would just uh, devour this kind of stunt cinema. And they were looking to cast, and they had already made stunt films with other actresses. A very interesting actress, actually a Bengali actress called Padma, was one of the first stunt actresses of the time. Oh. Esther Abraham, one of the first stunt actresses of the time. But Fearless Nadia became the big stunt actress, um, carefully kind of built up by, by Wadia Movie Tone as a kind of brand of her own. And they started making films solely for her and for that character of Fearless Nadia. So yeah, this is a very hugely important genre at that time, but one that those film critics of the time uh, ignored because they thought that these were fluff. Uh, but many of them were actually making very important kinds of raising important questions um, about imperialism and even caste. One of Fearless Nadia's films is called Hurricane Hansa, but Hurricane Hansa is a Dalit girl who takes on this disguise to avenge uh, her oppressors. Uh, so there's a lot of very exciting stuff happening and I wish we could see many of these movies. So maybe we look forward to that as your next book. It's back to Rohan, he's back. Sorry, I had some connection problems. Uh, a question from my side. So you mentioned that as uh, the original locations like Dadar started becoming crowded, people moved further and further into the suburbs for the studios. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but of course, at that time, the infrastructure in these suburbs was really very rudimentary, including erratic electric supply. So yeah. how did these studios manage? Did development follow the studios or how was it? 
That is such a great question. And I went down a real rabbit hole because I want, I had to answer that same question, right? You can't make films without electricity. And you don't just need electricity. You need a steady voltage, steady supply. Um, and you need a lot of uh, power because the lights that were used in studios at this time were very high voltage lights that drew a lot of energy. Uh, so you need steady and constant uh, electric supply. So I started to do a little bit of that history to track the ways in which electrification started to spread from South Bombay to the suburbs. So, you, so in my book, there's a section in chapter two where I talk about how important electricity was and this history of electrification of Bombay also to cinema, not just because it was required. So like Bandra, um, Andheri, there are particular moments when the electric supply there becomes much more regular and standardized. And that's when the studios are also are able to move to these places. Otherwise people would often do day trips and do a day trip to Vasai or Vasai Lake or Pawai Lake or something and shoot there. Um, Malad happened for Bombay Talkies because uh, Dinshaw on their board of directors already had, um, uh, it was his country house. It was his escape from the city. So he gave that to them. Um, and there was, uh, and yeah, they, they had a lot of generator vans, but yeah, they had electric supply because Bombay Talkies also start, had its own processing laboratory on its premises. So they process their own films. Um, so yeah, this is another very crucial part of the puzzle, history of electricity and cinema. You can't watch films without electricity. You can't make films <laughs> without electricity. And, and that, uh, yeah, that's a very important factor. Thank you, that is very interesting. Um... Going through your slides, and you also mentioned about the German connection. So even in your slides, a lot of the sources I see are labeled as the Wirsching archives, and you have Franz Austin credited in some of the slides. Uh, yeah. Is that the topic of your next research as well? It's um, So there is a book that's going to be coming out, hopefully at the end of this year, that's basically premised on the Wirsching images. So Joseph Wirsching is a German cinematographer who moves, um, who was employed by Bombay Talkies in when it's founded along with the German director, Franz Austin. And Wershing then decides to live permanently in India. So his family currently lives in Goa and they have preserved this very remarkable archive of photographs, which is the first time I ever saw production stills about the making of films like behind the scenes images from the 1930s. And you can imagine that for a time when the films don't exist often, to see a behind the scenes glimpse of what filmmaking was like, it just blows your mind. And you get a lot of sense, like that image I showed you about the artificial rain being generated inside the set for Bhabi. Like you get a real sense of what are the techniques, what are the innovations that India's earliest filmmakers were using to, um, with, with very limited resources. So, uh, so a book is now coming out, uh, published by Mappin and the Alkazi Foundation uh, on Joseph Wershing and his uh, and his photographs. So, I yeah, keep a lookout for it. Uh, it should be out later in 2021, and it's a beautifully illustrated book. There's going to be a hundred images at least. Look forward to it. And a small observation, you mentioned that uh, the Times of India never published uh, movie reviews of local... In, initially, initially. Yeah. So I vaguely remember that one of uh, our advertising textbooks in college had a snippet of a movie review from the Times of India in 1923 uh -huh. uh, about an, uh, a movie called uh, The Light of Asia, uh, oh, yeah. The Leuchter Asians. Yeah. So was that then such movies were not considered as German movies, uh, as Indian movies, because they were produced in Germany? And that's why the Times of India may have been taken it up. That's very, that's a good point. No, because Light of Asia was made by the same people that, of Bombay Talkies. But at that time, they were doing international collaborations. So they didn't live in, in Bombay. Many of them didn't know Hindi, Urdu, Hindustani. Like Deveka Rani had to teach herself these languages because they knew Bengali or they knew German, or they knew English, or they knew French, right? But they didn't know the North Indian uh, 
languages. Um, so yeah, Light of Asia got a lot of press actually across the world. I've seen Light of Asia being advertised and reviewed in South African newspapers, in Australian newspapers, uh, of course, British newspapers, German newspapers, because this was seen as this kind of cosmopolitan, international co-production co kind of a company. Um, and it was a silent film with all these British and German interests, so it was reviewed. But I also want to mention that when Times of India finally started its Indian film reviews, uh, one very important uh, journalist and film critic emerges who also have written about uh, perhaps one of the first female film critics of India, Claire Mendonca. So she's, um, so Claire Mendonca writes very sharp, very detailed and interesting film reviews. Um, I think starting in the late thirties through the 1940s. And uh, she becomes so popular. She's part, she's the only woman in the Bombay Film Journalists Association. Um, and uh, a very, very important in that sense, female pioneer figure. One of those women that helped build Bombay cinema that we have completely kind of overlooked. So yeah, um, have to mention Claire Mendonca. Actually, when the Filmfare Awards were first instituted in their earliest form, there was a suggestion that they should be called the Claire Awards uh, as a tribute to the first female film critic um, of Bombay. That, that didn't happen. But thank you for sharing that interesting snippet. Uh, it's just beyond 7.30 India time. So I think that we're done with the questions. So I think we should also let people go on with their Saturday evenings. And I'm sure they're going to spend a lot of time discussing this talk and reminiscing about it. So thank you so much for joining us and sharing all of these stories. Uh, really enjoyed it over the past hour and a half. Thank you so much. And thank you everyone for being here. I know these are very, very difficult times um, in India and uh, I wish I was in Bombay with you, but soon. Thank you everyone. Thank you Rohan so very much. Bye. No problem. Thank you everyone. And we hope to see you at a Khaki event very, very soon. Thanks for the invitation. Bye.